Okay, uh, dear friends, uh, uh, thank you very much for your participation. I think that uh, we have a, a very great opportunity today because uh, we can hear directly from the voice of uh, one of the protagonists of uh, one uh, of more uh, impressive uh, company in the world. And uh, so I have the pleasure to introduce to you uh, Mr. J. Elliott, that is the author of the Steve Jobs book, and uh, Matteo Rico Oepli, that uh, is the editor of this very interesting manuscript. Uh, uh, I think that uh, we have to ask ourselves uh, one question. Why Apple was able to do what uh, she was able to make uh, related to the other one company? Uh, for example, uh, uh, thinking how Apple was able to invent and reinvent the personal computer, or uh, to think it the creation of a storage of a music as iTunes, and the other one company in the industry of music were not able to think and to image. Or how Apple was able to create a phone as the iPhone with just one button, and uh, the more important competitor is Nokia, that is uh, in this uh, business uh, with uh, all uh, the hacks uh, in the same basket, uh, was not able uh, to think and uh, to create. Probably the answer uh, is uh, in, uh, uh, in the words and uh, in the facts presented by uh, Elliot, but uh, I have a, a very, very short uh, answer to uh, the question. And uh, the answer uh, probably is uh, in uh, the philosophy of uh, Apple as a company that uh, has the customer at the center of uh, all uh, his decision. But uh, specifically, I think uh, that uh, the more uh, profit uh, is, uh, is uh, in the philosophy of uh, Steve Jobs, that uh, is the marketer of the marketers. And without uh, to be too much a partisan, uh, is uh, the best marketing manager in the world. Because uh, everything uh, that uh, he thinks uh, and uh, he acts uh, and uh, he makes uh, is uh, just uh, with uh, one perspective, uh, to create, uh, to transfer value to his uh, customer. So Apple uh, is uh, not uh, just uh, a fruit uh, <laughs> to bite it, but uh, is effectively is a, a fruit uh, that uh, when uh, we buy it, uh, we can uh, profit the uh, experience uh, uh, that uh, is uh, astonishing and incredible. Now, I please, uh, Jay, you have uh, the microphone to explain uh, to us the secret uh, of SSA. Thank you. Buongiorno, Mucante. That's the beginning and the ending of my, my Italian. Sorry about that. Um, I have my, my son is here. He's 16 year old. He's He's the bilingual person in my family, but I'm not. One of the uh, first thing I'll start with, first of all, thanks for inviting me here. I enjoy being in Italy. My first time in Italy also. Spent a lot of time in Europe and not in Italy. Um, and I, uh, something happened to the computer. Um, I uh, enjoy being here. And it's gorgeous weather and a great place to be. The, one of the questions I get is, um, why did I write this book? Um, one of the reasons I wrote the book was I have a philosophy which I've been thinking about for many years, and I, um, and I was interested in um, sharing that philosophy with everybody and looking at a new way to work and a new way to lead, lead management, a new way to lead companies, and to emulate what happened. And Steve Jobs uh, was my classic model for that, for the new way I believe that corporations have to exist and, and operate in the future. And so basically, that's what the book is about. I view this as a, as a model for the way society and corporations have to operate and to have the same kind of success that, that Apple had, has had. If you look at this, this slide, if you look at a couple things to note about this slide, one, there's a guy up in the right-hand corner with a beard, that's me, a young guy. At that time, this was taken in the early 80s. But the other thing, the other thing amazing about this slide is that Everybody around the table is less than 30 years old, except for me. So I was, the, I was the elder statesman of that group. But this group, if you think about it, this group of people created an industry that lives on today and is worth billions of dollars. Now, at the moment we did it, we didn't realize that we had done that, but this was a group of people who were, were focused 
The other thing you notice about this photograph, Steve is wearing a tie. Uh, that's also a unique for Steve Jobs, who eventually wore, wore T-shirts and, and Levi's. In fact, when I met him, I met Steve at a restaurant one night, and uh, we got to talking. That, that he had a beard at the time, so the only similarity we had were beards. Um, but we got to chatting about computers. He told me about a company he had called Apple Computer. I worked at a company called Intel at the time. I'd come from a company named IBM before that. So I'd never heard of Apple. And I said, I've never heard of your company. And in those days, a 25-year-old entrepreneur was very unusual for Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley was dominated by IBM, Hewlett Packard, and, and Intel. So that was very unusual to see this young guy. We got talking, and I really, really understood his vision at the time about bringing the whole computer ability down to the individual. His whole had a vision, which was, why can't a person have this power of this machine around them rather than having to go to a computer room and have the information displayed down to you? And so I really caught his vision, and it really intrigued me because I'd been involved in programming computers for about nine years and, and involved in computer systems, and I really got it that there's a way, if we could bring that power down to the person, then we would really have something. And actually, Apple then was already in, embarked on a thing called the, the, Apple, the Apple II, and it was really the beginning of the, of the success of Apple. And Apple had a, at the time that the Apple II came out, it became the favorite for teachers. Teachers were able to program it, were able to build products for their students, and be able to use it to create power for what they were doing in the classroom. They became the, really the number one, the number one uh, uh, users of the Apple. Also, it became a product that supported a piece of software that was very important in the early stages of computers in the late 80s called VisiCalc. VisiCalc was a computer software that allowed the first accounting of a, at, a, at an individual level. So co corporate CFOs could start using an accounting software to control a company through this little box on their desk called the Apple II. So, but then in early, in, when I first met Steve, we took a tour of a place called Xerox Park. Xerox Park is a, is, a, is a research lab located in Palo Alto, California that was designed for Xerox to build new technologies. At that park, we went through and we were given a demo of a product called the Star System. The Star System was a huge printer system and at the end of it was a, was a terminal that had a mouse and it had, a, had icons on a screen which had been developed in the late 70s. So you think about where we are today, there hasn't been a hell of a lot to change in where we, what we operate today. We just do it differently. But Xerox had developed all this technology. Now, a lot of people said, wow, you stole this from Xerox. No, we didn't steal it from Xerox was a, at that time, owned 20% of Apple. So Xerox was an investor in Apple, and they wanted Apple to sort of look at this technology. But they didn't realize at that moment what they were showing Steve Jobs. What they showed him was, a new way to, to, to operate and to bring information to you. And the new way to bring information to you was a thing called a mouse, that I could now move around on the screen, I could pick off files, I could move information, I could do things with the movement of my hand. One of the fascinations Steve Jobs has was with his hand. A lot of times we'd be sitting in meetings and Steve would be looking at his hand and sort of looking around it and trying to figure out, if you think about your hand, the hand is one of the most important devices you have for expressing yourself. I just go like that, or I can point to you. I can send out information with my hand versus bringing inform information through my eyes uh, or through my ears or giving information out through my mouth. But what he was really fascinated was, how can we design a computer that ultimately can bring the power of the hand as ability to use the computer? So today, if you're using an iPhone, you're using a finger using a computer, it's on an iPad, using a finger. So basically what Steve has, what has evolved from 1970, 1980 to today is the ability to input information or export information through a computer system with just your finger. And that's really, what it really points out is that Steve is a visionary. But Steve's vision is extends beyond many, many years. It looks out to where this, this technology, but the biggest, the most important point here is what are you going to do with technology? I'm a, I'm a quasi-technologist. I'm a programmer by trade. But I really, in my current operations, I'm a founder of a company. 
I've founded about five companies over the last five years and done some very innovative things, looking for new ways to do things. But I look at a way to visualize where is this technology going to go, but how do we use technology to better what we're doing? I think that's the most important part here, is that what do we do with this? I don't have, have to be a, a research scientist. I just have to be able to extrapolate what is this research going to do to move it to here. As we move out through society, there's a movie today called Avatar. If anybody saw it or not, but in there they, they move a lot of information on glass by their hands. And that really is a future of technology that it's about how do you move information, what information do we really need, and what is the technology available to us to do that. And I think that's, that's a beginning point of anybody looking at either want a career in technology or want a career in business. What is this going to do and where is it going to go? I think that the other part of this is one great other at attribute that I learned from Steve Jobs. If you can think about it, then build it. If I can think about something that's reasonably built based on reasonable current technology, then build one that I can see what it looks like. So, so prototyping becomes the ultimate down inside to, if I want to create a product, if I want to create a company, then go out there and try it, and go out there and start building it, go out there and start playing for it. But it really leads me to, the, to sort of my next slide, which is what I call the product czar. One of the most important parts about Steve Jobs, Steve is the product. So when you're talk, when Steve is on stage and he's introducing an iPad or an iPod, he's that product. When he uses the iPad or the iPod and he's standing there talking to you about it, he is the product, because that's his product. And it's the classic interesting thing about that he builds the product for himself first and then he shares it with you. And that's a really an important quality of building products. It's not like, I'm gonna build this product over here, hopefully you'll like it and hopefully it, it matches you. Uh, but I, I have to like it first. And I think the one thing, one big message I got from Steve Jobs and working there and understanding how we design these products is the product has to be what you want first, and then you share it with the world. And it also has to be about something that really that you're going to support, that you're going to be part of, that you're going to use. Um, I always laugh. If I was the CEO of a, of a car company, I looked in the parking lot and my employees weren't driving my car, I'd be pretty upset because obviously they weren't as committed to my car as I am. I mean, you have to be, you have to live this commitment, and that's what Steve Jobs is all about. The, that sort of manifests itself into that any, any of the passion, all of you are students here, eventually you're gonna go out in life and you're gonna work on do certain things, certain jobs. It's gotta start with a passion for what you wanna do with that product. And the, and the apple starts with a passion for the product to make it happen. In the early days of, to show how far we took it, in the early days of Apple, when you got hired as an employee, we handed you our product, and we gave you a test 30 days later, and if you passed the test, you were an employee. If you failed the test, you were fired. We said, we're so committed to this product, and you better be as committed as we are, or you're not gonna work here. Now, it sounds sort of harsh in some ways, but in reality, that's what you want out. That's the only way to keep this stuff going. You also have to figure out what are, you, what are you building? What is this going to do? Is it, are you building a product that's going to solve a problem? Are you building a product that's going to be uh, future to the world? Where is all of this going to go? And what is the upside to what you're going to do? And how does that relate to what the vision is? In 2000, so I left, so Steve left Apple in 1985. He left there under bad circumstances. He had a fight with the chairman of the board, the board of directors, and they basically threw him out. I chose, to, I went around the board, of, I went around the CEO and I went to the board of directors and said, you guys are making an incredible mistake. Steve is the vision for Apple. This isn't a normal company. We're not talking about a corporation that operates that. This is a vision of a guy that, is, his vision is beyond what you're thinking about. So you're making, so here's the way to do it. Let's spin Steve out, make him a separate company. That way you keep him outside the fray, but also then you can go on with the rest of Apple which they didn't want to do. So Steve left Apple. A year later, I left because I realized that I, in fact, Apple is the last company I worked for as a person because it's since then I've been founding my own companies. What I learned is that I could never work for a company again. I could never work for a person again. I'm a founder, I'm a CEO type, I'm an inventor, I'm a visionary, and I needed to be on my own. So since Apple, and I left Apple in 1987, I've been on my own, I've founded about seven or eight companies. And so that's the other part of it, is that 
what is compelling about this to you? What is compelling about the product you're building? And I think the thing, if you look at Apple products from day one till today, the compelling part of until that period of time, which I'll sort of call the dark period when Steve left and came back. In fact, when Steve arrived back, Apple was 30 days away from being bankrupt. It had just it had continued on, but it's amazing. It went almost nine years, really, on Steve's vision of what the company should do with the wrong people managing it. And yet that shows the power of, if you have a vision, you can operate on it. Even back, back in 1984, we were talking about products with different colors in them. In 19, if you look at that, computers in 1984, they were one color. They were one drab color because people didn't want to leave fingerprints on them. We even were talking about colored Macs in those days. We were talking about, we came up with a prototype we called the Dino Pad, which was a pad you opened up and had a screen on one side and a keyboard on the other side. So way back in the early 80s, we were talking about a lot of products and a lot of things that, that we felt compelled about that, that, really, that really were what dro drives the thing, thing, same thing. The other thing you have to look about, it, when you're going to create a product, and you're going to be a product czar, and I hope all of you leave this university and become that, um, that you got to know what problem does it solve? You know, is it just being, I look today at the marketplace, what I call the Me Too markets. Um, the, uh, Apple comes out with a thing called an iPad. Then you have all these other companies from Samsung, other companies now coming out with their own pads. You came out with the iPhone, all these other companies coming out with their own, with their own phones. And the big difference is, is, this, is it, are you trying to solve a problem or are you just trying to follow a market? And I think that's another very important part of it, that either you're gonna be a creator of a market and be on your own, own standard for that market, or you're gonna follow a market. And those are, again, decisions you have to make when you're in the product, in the position of creating products or becoming your product czar. The ultimate user and seller is you. I can sell you my product all day long because I'm the ultimate user. I'm also the ultimate seller of it. I'm, when everybody says, well, Steve's a great sales, sales guy, yeah, because he believes in what he's selling. He believes that when he stands on stage, the best product up there is what he's sell, selling to you. And that's really, if you don't have that commitment or that ability to do that, then you're not going to get very far in building products. It, it also, can you sell it? And I, what I tell when I go out to seminars and I talk to leaders of industry, I take them aside to give them a couple minutes, sell me your product. I mean, if you can't sell me your product and I don't agree with you and I don't think it's the best thing in the market as the quality of the things in the market, then I don't really feel very comfortable that you really understand the product. I also believe that, that comes, what comes across here is quality. Everybody complains about Apple products being very expensive. Well, you're paying for what you get. They're not going to discount the product because it's the quality. However, the new products will be discounted. We'll get to that later. Success is in the details. Everybody, everybody for a while, when an iPod came out, you saw these cords hanging around people's uh, their ears down the front of them. That was a statement that's unbelievable because what that said was, you're either cool or you're not cool. It said was is that this little tiny detail on a product called, remember, Sony had totally dominated the, the uh, removable or the transportable music business with a product called the Walkman for 25 years. They sold over 230 million of these units. Where's the Walkman today? Gone. What happened? Because Walkman didn't keep up with the current technology called digital music. Uh, secondly, Walkmans were cool, by the way, in their days, but they were, did not have the coolness of having these white cords hanging around this little product in your hand. In the development of the, iP of the iPod, the, the basic challenge that Steve gave to the engineers was it can only have one button. You can only have to press one button. That's, everything has to be designed off that one button, which is everybody said it cannot be done. Absolutely cannot be done. And absolutely it was done. And again, because if you can dream it and you think the technology is there, there's no reason that you can't adapt technology to make it work. In. But, the, but the important here is the success in details. And that's really critical about sort of the products, the products are. When I would ask you the question in the audience, and we'll have a question and answer later, uh, what products do you admire? First thing you have to understand when you're building quality products, what products do you admire? One term I use a lot when I consider about Steve Jobs and Apple, I consider artists versus engineers. Steve is an artist. If 
you look at artists, they are creative. If you look at artists, they're usually they're more fun, they're colorful. Um, in fact, the first graphics for, for the Macintosh came out of a restaurant in San Francisco called Chow. Chow was a restaurant in San Francisco that had great, great graphics in its, in its menu. The menu had great splash graphics that came out of an Italian artist. And so we hired the artist. So that artist, by the way, created the first icons for the Mac. That artist created the first screen present, first screen experience, created all of the material that went around on the box, all of the painting. So remember the first, the first Mac. So it wasn't a product engineer, it wasn't a product designer, it wasn't a, some kind of a graphics designer, it was an artist. This lady, up until we hired her, she'd been doing art. And it could, she was a little mystified as we were. The other thing that happened on the, on the, on the product when we first did the Mac, we were sitting in a meeting and said, we really want to build a product that doesn't need an owner's manual. That you can, this product is so intuitive, you just take it out of the box, turn it on, and you don't have to have a manual to figure out what to do with it. And we couldn't, we tried every way possible, but we couldn't get around it. So we're sitting in a meeting, and this one person, one engineer said, we need somebody to write the manual at a 12th grade level. And Steve said, great, let's go find a 12th grader. So we went to the local high school, we did a contest, and found a 12th grader to write the original manual. And this was a senior in high school, because that's what everybody said had to have to write it. So this is, again, you have to think about things beyond what is normal, but these are details that sort of get lost. The other thing about Apple products, it's a total product. It is what, from beginning to end, it's one thing. It's one experience. It comes, gets designed, it's built, it has a unit, user interface, it has software, it's put in a box, it's delivered to you, and it's all one long, one, one feature from the beginning to the end. The box is designed specially to fit the product, it's designed specially that you don't have to ha have an owner's manual to use the product, it's easy to use, it's easy to open, but it goes from one end to the other. It's what I call the total product concept, which is really important when you're building a product. This something gets lost in the computer industry, because you'll find it started off by people building monitors, one company built monitors, one company built keyboards, one company built mainframes, one company built software, and it was all done by different things. And I, I always ask the question about what's gonna happen in the battle between uh, Apple and Microsoft, or Apple and Google with Android operating system. And I said, I always felt, and I've always felt, the reason I didn't go work for Microsoft, that if you have software on one side and hardware on the other side, and they're not coming from the same place, look what happened to Vista. Vista didn't work as a Microsoft product because the hardware it ran on, you couldn't support it. Because Dell put it on this hardware, or HP put it on that hardware, but it really hadn't been designed together. And that's really the important product of what I'll call the total product concept. And Steve, and this is another question, in fact, I just got to ask this question about 30 minutes ago, about open architect. Why isn't Apple an open architect? Because Steve doesn't want other people meddling inside his products that he doesn't have control over. He wants, again, to control the whole product so when he delivers it to you, he knows it's of high quality and it's the quality that he wants to build inside a product. Um, it also even, go, even goes back to service, that again, if now under the new sort of the new system of Apple, if you have a problem with your products, you walk into an Apple store, you either walk out there with a brand new product for free, or they'll fix it in a short period of time for very little money. Even the service on Apple products comes across in a very easy way, and a very easy way for the consumer to adapt to. The other part about the product, this whole success of details, if you're gonna build a product, and you're gonna launch it, it better be right. And that's, I'm just going through launching of the product myself. It's a software product, which I think is a great product for the world. Uh, about two weeks ago, I was in a meeting, and they said everything about the product is great except for this one little thing. When you do use this, the user happens to do this, it won't work. What do you mean it won't work? It'll shut off their iPhone. We can't have that. Well, they probably, nobody will do that. Well, no, we can't have that. So I said, sorry, we're not gonna ship the product. And so I've delayed that product almost a month now to fix that little quirk in the software. Yeah, I got it right. The, everybody talks about the Apple, the Apple iPod, the I, iPhone came out with the antenna problem. The antenna, which is very unusual, by the way, for an Apple product. And at the time, Apple got beat up in the media about what's going on there at Apple. You know, he came out with an inferior product. I'm not sure the antenna was that big of an issue. On my iPhone, I never had that problem, but maybe 
I, may, I think I have a bigger problem with AT&T as my phone service than I did have with the phone. But it's, but it's interesting that that happened. In fact, within hours, the guy that was responsible for that product got fired. Now, that, that's a very important, that's an important statement for the products are to make that, first of all, I want your input, I want to do it right, but when you set a standard of quality, you got to meet that quality. Otherwise, don't launch the product. When the Apple, original Apple came out in 1984, in May of 1983, we were in a meeting and the engineers brought the, brought the Mac in, set it on the table, turned it on, it worked perfectly. We we're all excited. We finally got it done. It's ready to be launched. The launch date had been set for, Jan for May. This was in April. And so we were very excited about it. Everybody sort of calmed down and Steve said, what's that sound? We said, well, it's the fan. What, what's, you can't have that. We gotta have a fan. I mean, there's no way to keep it cool without a fan. No, I don't want a fan. I don't want that noise. I want Apple products to be silent. Well, we can't, we have to redesign the whole product to make it quiet, then redesign it. So we delayed the introduction of the Macintosh for six months to fix the heat problem. And we had to dissipate the heat through other electronic or other engineering technology, which was a huge challenge. But again, today, one of the quality issues of an Apple product, it's silent. But the bad news about that Mac, if you laid a piece of paper on top, it would fry it. So it did have some problems on the road. Eventually, we got solved. But that's, those, those are very important parts about what I call success in details. It's a very, if you're gonna do something, do it right or don't do it. The other thing about talent. Um, the other, if you, look at, if you look at a company, they call most of their people employees or they call them, you know, whatever they're gonna call them is part of their company. At Apple, we consider people as talent. And one of the things about talent, talent means to recognize. If you look at this photograph, on the first Mac that was, that was introduced to the market in 1984, these signatures on the right side you see were engraved in the inside of the back cover. So anybody that bought a Mac, the original Mac, had the signatures of the 40 people that designed it uh, in the early days. Now, how many people build a product that they put the names of their employees inside to feel that confident about a product, that feel that great about what happened, and great about you as a talent, that make that kind of a statement inside the product itself? I mean, that is an incredible way to show, number one, recognition for the talent, but also the talent did it. The other interesting fact, you know, is if you see it, I don't know if you see it on the screen, but Steve Jobs' signature is in small caps. Steve used to sign his letter with a small S and a small J. I think Steve now has changed his signature to be a big S and a big J, but in the early days, because Steve enjoyed calligraphy, enjoyed the ability to express yourself with different kinds of fonts, different kinds of attitude. In fact, Gutenberg was one of his big one of his big heroes because what he did for the printing industry. So if you, that's the other part about this is talent also appreciates talent. And talent has to say, who are your, who are your her, her, heroes? Who do you like? Who do you appreciate? Steve Jobs may be one of them. When I grew up, Henry Ford was a hero I thought was incredible for what he did for the, for the auto industry. Buckmeister Fuller was a, was a guy I met in college that I thought was incredible for his engineering design. Uh, Steve loved Gutenberg. He loved Edmund Land. Land was the guy who invented the Polaroid camera. So who do you have as, who are in your life for heroes? Because that's where, that's the other part of having talent. Uh, who are you going to be your heroes? The other part, yeah, I said earlier when I started off my presentation that I sort of learned who I was. I had to learn what was, what was instinctually inside of me. I was, uh, I, I came out of, a, out of a farming industry. So I came out of a, I was raised on a thousand acre ranch with cows, and I was the first person to leave my family to go to college. And I read, the differences in my ranch, it was, it was had three and a half mi miles of beach frontage on the Monterey Bay. If you know where in California, it's, uh, it's Northern California, so I was raised on a little bit different kind of ranch, but it was still a dairy farm. But I'd learned that, that going through that a little bit about, about who you are. And what is, the other part of that is, who are you? Are you an artist? Are you somebody, are you a bureaucrat? Are you, do you like to follow rules? Are you ability to think out, think ahead? Do you have the ability to think outside the box? So you have to, again, get down to who you really are. And who, and what drives you? What is the thing, are you driven by, are you driven by being an artist? Are you driven by making money? Are you driven by conquering the world or helping the world? So these are the, these are things that are really important to get down to what is talent about and what rules talent. The other thing, we, we, we had a coin at Apple called Pirates, not the Navy. 
So we were looking at people who basically could think outside the normal, typical way of doing operations and business and thinking of ways to do it a little bit better, but not necessarily in a bureaucratic political environment. When I left IBM, I left there for that reason. I, I enjoyed IBM. I was considered a wild duck, but at IBM they say wild ducks fly in formation. So I didn't really feel that I really had that kind of opportunity at IBM that I really wanted. Um, so it was really about what is your strength? Are you a product person? Are you a process person? You have to really figure out as you go through, or if you go through either university life or your work life, and you're looking for new and challenge new people, what are your strengths? What things really drive you to make things happen? Um, the other thing about a talent is that the other important part of this whole basis of what makes this happen is you have to have a shared reason to exist. You have to be all together, all having the same commitment. The story I told you about issuing new employees apples, in fact, all new employees that, that Apple get whatever the new product is that comes out, because Apple wants everybody to know what it is and make sure they understand it, but they're also part of it. How do you think employees feel when Steve gets up on the stage and introduces a new product and gets all kinds of ovation for this great product, which they're part of? And that's all part of this sort of shared uh, recognition of who you are as a talent. Um, I mentioned earlier about hiring the artist. We hired a lot of people that would never work in most corporations, wouldn't have fit the, 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 what they wanted in the corporation, but they're incredibly talented people. So that's really important. I talked about the rewards. Rewards at Apple aren't, didn't come from when your birthday was or how many years you were in the company. It came from what you did. It came from what you accomplished. It came from the profit of the company shared with everybody. It came from getting time off to think about new ways to do things. So you have to think, when you're thinking of talent, and you're thinking about talent, you have to think of rewards in a different way. Apple's a team sport. The interesting thing about one of, one of Steve's uh, heroes was a guy named Morito, who was the chairman of the board of Sony. And Morito was a, interesting, he used to say, when we used to meet with, with him over in Japan, at that time, Sony was one of our big partners. He would say, you know, the, problem, the difference between Japan and the United States is we love rugby. In rugby, the whole team crosses the goal line at the same time. You love baseball, the guy hits a home run, it's one person. So that's the big difference in how teams versus single sports operate. And that's really what Apple is all, what really what Apple is all about. The other part about being a team sport, you have to be what I call a product-driven organization. And one of the things that come out of my book, which is very important, is that this is what makes it work. The company is driven by the products. The products drives the company. In order to do that, you have to be, have to have the ability. One of the major issues at Apple when Steve left was the Apple II was one product, Mac was another product. There were two separate products in one company. And unfortunately, the current CEO couldn't find a way to keep those, pull those together. You have to have a fully integrated company that goes all the way from research and development to marketing to sales to stores. I mean, the company has to come understand all the way from one end to the other, what I'll call horizontal communication. At Apple, we used to have, I set up most of the European sales operations when I was at Apple. I set up most of the Asian operations. Any office you walked in at Apple would be the same around the world. I made sure that when you walked into a, an office in Paris, France, or in Tokyo, Japan, that office looked just like an office in Cupertino, California. That they had the same spirit the same way it operated and the same culture that made it operate together. We used to broadcast corporate meetings over the, over the, over the uh, satellite. Today, obviously, you do it over the internet. People had to be on the same page of communication of what the company was doing. Um, what I call his holistic product development. In today's age, when you develop a product, you have to develop on myriad levels of technology. So when an iPhone is built today for Apple, phone is assembled in, in uh, China, the screen comes from Japan, but the development of it comes from Cupertino, California. That whole, that whole team, the development team, has to be equally partners to it as a team in Cupertino. So it's what I call, a, what I call holistic development. And it also has to be directed. People have to know where they're going to go, what the goals are. It has to be shared across the company. And when it's, when it's completed, everybody has an opportunity at it. The other thing about Apple, Apple became cool, as I said, when they had this, the cords. But the, 
biggest cool thing that's happened to Apple is the Apple Store. This is a picture of the store in New York. This store made $980 million last year, one store. I mean, that shows the power. And what all, when you think about it as a store, it isn't, it isn't really what I call a store. It's a demo center. The people come there to, to learn about the products. It's, become, it's becoming where it's at. Even, even becoming cool has become worldwide. I even saw in the paper recently that there's a line of people in Italy waiting for their, iP their new iPad, too. I mean, how many other products do you know in the world that people stand in line to go in and see, build their product? When I left San Francisco two days ago, I walked by an Apple store. People actually have camped out overnight to get, to get their iPad, too. And this is not a new product. This is a new develop. This is, a new, this is an upgrade developer product. How many people, other products in the world, do people stand around waiting to get to get to get to? So, it is becoming the other part of it. It is becoming cool, and the most important element of becoming cool is branding. Now, what Steve Jobs also learned early on in Apple, way back in the Apple II days in 1978, was that the brand meant something. If you can create a brand that has, and the brand again is about the product. If you look at companies that have multiple products, they have a problem. This Apple is a brand. Apple is a product. It isn't, as I said earlier, you have a Samsung phone with, with Android operating system. So that's two products. You have a Dell computer with Microsoft on it. That's two products. Apple is a product. So the brand is about the quality and the functionality of this product. And that's a really important thing to understand. And that's what becoming cool is. You also have to evangelize it. You have to tell the world how, well, how good it is. And you have to get people involved. Apple is great at getting developers involved. Now look, think about what they've done with apps. The app business started three years ago. It's a $3 billion business today. How, that's, how many businesses do you know can start up in three years from now and be $3 billion? How many apps? There's 300,000 apps written. There's apps written for everything. Most of them are very good. Some are not good. A lot of them are free. Some are paid for. But it's a whole business. iTunes. At the time iTunes hit, it was a whole new thing. It was, in fact, Everybody said it isn't going to work. Everybody said the Apple store is not going to work. But the ingredients for the store was great products, a great experience in the store, and if you want to buy a grape, but you don't have to. But also think about the undercurrent philosophy of the store. You buy an iPhone, but you're using a, a Microsoft computer at home. Eventually, what are you going to buy? Your iPhone is compatible with what? It's not compatible with your Microsoft, your Dell computer. It's compatible with another... Or you buy an iPad, what's it, compa what's it compatible with? My iPhone's compatible with my iPad, it's compatible with my iPod, it's compatible with my Mac computer. So anybody who buys one of those products ultimately is probably going to buy another one of the products. When the iPhone got introduced, everybody said, oh, wow, I'm not sure that this new thing called the iPad is going to be successful. Certainly it was. It was just an extension of my iPhone. It was just a big iPhone. In fact, I called my iPhone my iPhone, my iPad Nano, because it's just a it's just a small version of the iPad. So if you look at that strategy of, again, the product and the product rules, that's really where it's going to go. Now, Apple today has created a, a retail strategy which is going to be thought about for years and it's going to make this, this market very competitive because now all of these companies have to adjust to it. Microsoft has to adjust to it. Google has to adjust to it. All of the oh, – Samsung, all the uh, – all of these other corporations in the world selling product are selling them through multiple stores that sell multiple products. You walk into a Best Buy, you walk into a store that selling a lot of products, you have to figure out which one you want. A lot of people shop by price, by what TV set you should buy. You walk into an Apple store, there's only one decision to make. And so he's taken the whole concept of retail and driven it down to a new paradigm, which now is going to be interesting. Even the cost. So before, when you bought an Apple product, you had to pay the company you bought it from, the store, 30 to 35 percent was left there. And then the money went to Apple. Today, Apple doesn't leave any money. Apple now can start making its products significantly more economically challenging um, to, the, to the future because they don't spend all this money on retail. The bad news about a Apple apps, by the way, is when I create an app, I got to give Apple 30 percent of my revenue. Uh, but I understand they're that's, another, that's another, another business they created. But again, if you look at this whole strategy, now basically this is the end of my presentation, so I want to take questions, but let me just comment on, on where I think all this is going to go. The, if you start, 
if you're going to go out in business on your own and you're going to be try to get in, in industry and be a part of industry, you have to decide what you're going to do. And again, to me, the thing about I'm getting across in my book is that there's a new paradigm of leadership and management, I believe, has to come to the universe. And that has to be a way that everybody is on the same page and we're creating quality products and we're driven by those products. So that's really what I want to leave with you today. So now I'll open it up for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, before to animate the discussion with uh, your question, I think that uh, Matteo can uh, tell us something uh, about uh, also very, the, the entrepreneurial story of the family. Okay. Buongiorno, buongiorno a tutti, sono molto contento di essere qua insieme a voi, anche perché eh, 30 anni fa ero lì su, su queste, anch'io seduto a sentire le lezioni e penso che sentire Jay Elliott che parla di uno dei grandi geni del mondo, cioè Steve Jobs, sia per, per tutti noi e per voi che state studiando eccezionale. Eh, volevo dire brevemente due cose sulla casa editrice Oepli che forse voi conoscete perché ha fatto un branding per 140 anni e su Milano addirittura ci siamo fatti fare una via in maniera che nessuno si dimentichi mai dove siamo. No? Quando uno dice Oepli siamo una specie di super apps abbiamo fatto. Um, Oepli ha pubblicato uh, per 140 anni libri di scienza, abbiamo investito solo unicamente sulla scienza noi. Tanti ci chiedono, ma adesso fate dei libri su appunto, Steve Jobs o sull'informatica, e noi rispondiamo, beh è la scienza, sempre la stessa cosa che però va avanti. Eh, tantissimi italiani hanno studiato sui nostri manuali, come coltivare il pomodoro, come fare la televisione, lo chauffeur dell'automobile del 1910, perché noi insegnavamo con i nostri libri come fare qualcosa. I libri non servono solo a entertainment, quindi a divertirsi, ma a imparare a fare qualcosa e aiutare il mondo ad andare avanti. Oepli ha pubblicato libri che fanno questo, cioè aiutano le persone a essere migliori e andare avanti. Con Steve Jobs, eh, questo libro eccezionale scritto da Jay Elliott, penso che abbiamo fatto qualcosa addirittu addirittura di nuovo, neanche più parlare di come non so, organizzazione per esempio ma come pensare come avete sentito da, da Jay Elliott la cosa molto interessante è che prima di qualsiasi cosa devi pensare una strategia di come tu penserai quali sono le tue idee e come tu andrai avanti e probabilmente è la cosa più eccezionale che Steve ci ha insegnato non, non sto più a nominare quello che ha fatto ma se ci pensate ogni giorno io mi, mi impressiono per quello che è riuscito a fare, addirittura, come diceva il professor Valdani, la Nokia è in grandissime difficoltà. E diciamo che tre anni fa avremmo tutti scommesso su Nokia, invece. Eccezionale, quindi questo. Ehm, spero quindi che possiate, diciamo, godervi il libro e, e imparare molto, e ovviamente studiando qui alla, alla Bocconi, speriamo di avere eh, 300 circa nuovi entrepreneur che faranno dei bellissimi oggetti o prodotti che useremo nel futuro. Eh, grazie mille, adesso passiamo alle domande. Well, uh, now the time is for you. There are some questions. You can profit to have uh, here with us uh, Jay Elliott, so we can ask uh, him something that uh, can be useful for you. Okay. Are you able to speak a very Lower the voice. Well, I think if you look well, first of all, if you look back at look back at the beginning of the vision of what Apple became when Steve left Apple what I consider Apple failed Apple there was a huge failure first of all they told the first failure they had was the Apple 3 which they recalled and killed the product um, there was a lot to be learned about that about that product and then Steve when Steve left ultimately Apple was down the tubes again I think I think ultimately failure and if you look at what Steve has failed at you have to learn from it and I believe that I don't I don't think if you have the right vision and you have the right product strategy, the 
great thing about one of the other questions I get asked a lot, what happens now that Steve leaves Apple? First of all, Steve cannot be replaced, obviously, um, but he's put together sort of a, a group of people with a product strategy and a future that will hopefully not have that problem. I think failures will come, uh, but I believe you have to learn from them. The antenna problem they had, they, they didn't respond fast enough to the, to the media attack on it. I think what Apple's gonna learn now is if they have any future failures, they're gonna get attacked pretty heavily because they count so much on success. Uh, but I believe they're gonna run into that and I believe that they'll handle it. I mean, just like they do everything they've done, everything else. I don't, you know, it's the kind of technology they're dealing with is really complicated as we go further in life. You know, so I assume there's gonna be failures, but they're gonna respond to it as they have. Well, I think, well, first of all, he's put, a, he's put together, first of all, you cannot replace Steve. Steve is one of a kind in history. And uh, so what he's put together is a people who can emulate sort of the, some of his features, people who can emulate the ability to present a product, emulate the ability to sell a product. I think uh, the, currently they're, the guy they have, Cook, I think is a great guy. He's not, he's a little bit more, he's not, he's more of an introvert than Steve was, but then he's got his marketing guy. So I think. He's been able to take the great qualities of him and be able to emulate those in other people. But he will not be Steve, and he will not, he will not have somebody on stage that can give that real true uh, presentation of what the product is. Hope this isn't going to go on YouTube. I hope. Um, I uh, well, first of all, that's an interesting point. By the way, you know, Nokia dominated the handheld phone market for years. Made a big mistake in not keeping up with the market. They're going to lose big time. I believe that Microsoft has made one mistake after the other, from from cell phones, their own, by the way, um, to others. So I don't see it going anywhere. Personally, um, I think that Nokia has a strong company in place, but I think they've they're they're behind the curve right now. I would be very surprised if that partnership works out, other than having a lot of money put into it. I have uh, one question about the products. A lot of people are already um, waiting for the mid-size iPad. Means that uh, you have the quality of, of iPhone so you can take it around very easily, uh, but with all the feature of the, the A iPad, the iPad 2. Do you think they will ever come up one or, or no? What is it again, I'm not sure what size. The, the mid-size, the, like the Galaxy, the Samsung Galaxy. I don't know, I, I feel that the iPad size was the perfect size. I feel like it was like a sheet of paper and I believe that it was really, I think to make it smaller or bigger, I believe probably will not happen. Next week I'll be wrong, but I believe that the, the size of the iPad I think fit the needs of the user, and um, I think also what the iPad has done is created a whole different genre, which is the it, it eliminates laptops, it eliminates it basically will eliminate desktops. I think the whole revolution now will be I can carry it with me wherever I go, whatever I want. Uh, one of the companies I founded was called Migo, M-I-G-O. In fact, I wanted to call it Mio because it was a I was able to carry a computer inside a flash drive, and I could plug it in any other computer in the world, it would take it over, become my computer, do all my work on it, and then I'd pull it out and it would leave no trace I was there. Um, so this, but that worked out great for that moment in time. But I think these technologies now are gonna be so, so gone from the beat, as I said, we're gonna get down to a, something that looks like a pane of glass. But I think the size 
I think the iPad hit it right on. Now you see all the, all the Me Too competitors come out with bigger, smaller, <laughs> sideways, plug it here, do that. But I don't think they have a chance in the marketplace. And I think, I think the iPhone's the right size, and I think the iPad's the right size. And I don't view that Apple's going to alter their, what they think is right. So I think as I understand it, she's, first of all, you can call me Jay, by the way, not Mr. Elliott. Um, secondly, I, so I think you said that the, you're comparing the iPad sales to the Microsoft, which, huh? Okay, but you're comparing a replacement software that sells for, Microsoft makes uh, $29 off of, to a piece of hardware where Apple makes about $800 off of. So it's, it's, like, it's like the Android comparison, they say, Android is taking over their cell phone market. Android is given to the manufacturers for free. 50% of the revenue in the cell phone market comes from the iPhone. So it's a nice comparison of numbers, but they don't mean anything. <laughs> I mean, I mean what, how, what do you mean, how did I start to work? I mean, I talked about meeting him, but did I talk about that, or I, I don't know if it, I mean, where I met him, or? Oh, I finally got, I finally had a headhunter call me. I said to him, by the way, I didn't think he could afford me, because I was an executive at that time at Intel, and he had a headhunter call me, and the guy said, okay, Mr. Jobs wants to hire you, how much? And so I gave him a number, and I, I thought, I said, that's ridiculous, and he got back to me and said, that's fine. So. About a month later, I went to work there, walked in the office, and that's when we sat down. The amazing thing about me working for Steve Jobs, I was the only person in the company to come from IBM. So I was, IBM was the, the enemy, the big enemy of, of Apple at the time. And there's two things about Steve and I's relationship. As I said in that photograph, I was 40 years old, the rest of them were under, were under 30. Steve used to say, never trust anybody over 40 except for Jay. So that was, that was his number one coin that he would always say. So we started off in this sort of, uh, I was more of a mentor, I'd say, in one hand, but I was more like the parent. And he was more like the child. I was like, like dealing with my child every day. And it was, uh, but in a very positive way, not a negative way. And uh, so that's, I walked in his office and we sat down and I took over initially, I took over what's called the, the corporate functions of Apple. I had the IT department, the planning department, I had the county department, I had the human resource department. So I took over sort of the operational note, but I was working for Steve, but I also worked for Steve. He was the president of the Macintosh group, so I had two roles. I worked from there helping develop the Mac, so I had two jobs, actually. I don't know if that answered your question or not. Yes. Well, I think that, first of all, it's a very good question. It's one of the harder questions I have to answer. But again, to me, it goes back to the product strategy. You know, if you look at, I just saw today, Siemens announced that they're, they, you know, they have, they're cutting back on their type of their organization, and they're focusing on sort of four factors in their company. And they're focusing on four products, basically. And the way to do that is to productize your company, not, not functionalize it. What happens in these big companies they will have major marketing departments or sales departments rather than focused on the product. What is this? This all comes under a product group and focused on that product. Now, the other thing you have to make sure is that product is in tune with other products if they can be within your company. So Siemens is a diversified company that's more difficult because they got medical products and they got, they got phone products and they got, now they're going into making transportation products. 
but it has to be productized. The only way you can do that is have what is the defined products that you're going to build? Do they have a relationship with the other products you're going to build? You'd like them to if you could. Uh, that's the way to keep it as simple as possible. But functionalizing is not the way to go. I don't know. I think that, you know, sort of a matter of timing and a matter of what people want. I don't know if, if all of a sudden, you know, there's a better demand for, you know, colored iPhones or right now there's obviously the huge covers that goes on iPhones, a huge market. It's a $2 billion market just on iPhone covers. So people like color and design. I'm not sure that Apple would want to do that because of the cost it would take. In the old, early days of Apple, they weren't making that many products. I mean, they were making you know, maybe a million Macs, but now they're making 20 million iP iPads. I mean, it's a different quantity of how, how you can diversify the color and make work. Probably not. I think the, you know, the simplistic product of all is the egg, you know, if that, which is the one, one great color and look, or mostly one great color, but uh, I think it'll probably stay like it is. And then we'll leave, there's this massive uh, cover to cover market, leave that alone. I think one of the, as I said earlier, one of the features I believe that will make it um, better affordable as, as, as they control the retail channel, which they are, they can make cheaper products. And I believe one of the dreams, in fact, in 1980, 1980, our dream was to produce a $995 Mac. That was in 1980. That was what the original target for the Mac, it came out at $25.95. And the reason for that is that the decision by the by the marketing and sales department was, we need to add premiums to it to make it more valuable. But I think that that vision is still there and eventually because of the control of the retail channel. I mean, there's already iPhones today sell for $49. I mean, to have that, I mean, in the United States, I'm not sure anywhere else, but it, that, it's gonna get down there based on the economic, the way the company currently is operating. I think they can get to that point. I think that's one of the dreams. Yeah, I think that, uh, I think as I understand the question about uh, ability to create a product for people who don't know what they want. I mean, I think that again, but it comes back from what do you want? I mean, I think it comes back to uh, the design of a product that you want or want to use. And I think that's, and I think the mistake I believe sometimes and what I do with my own products, when I'm thinking about creating a product, I talk about everybody around me, my friends, people I meet in a bar, people I meet in an airplane, what do you think of this? I mean, I, I get more real feedback from just talking to people than market research does. And I think it has to get down to a human level of you're designing something. Talk to your friends, talk to your family, talk to everybody around you. I mean, that's how, it, and that, but again, Steve has this innate ability to sort of visualize that and be able to articulate that. Uh, that part is gonna be interesting. That, that, that is one part of Apple that'll be interesting is that the future of that being able to do that because he's, a, he's our, a lot of people there can understand it, but it's really a really unique skill. But personally, what I do is I talk to everybody around me about my product and, uh, and see what they think about it. Um, for instance, I have, 
I have a product here. There's a little button. You press on your iPhone right there. You press it. Hold it down for three seconds. It contacts an emergency call center in the United States. It gets my exact GPS location. So if I had <laughs> fell over the stage here, I could press the button, and they'd know exactly where I was and respond to my emergency, even though I do not know that the emergency number is in Italy. I know it's the United States, but if I press that button anywhere in the world on my iPhone, it'll give an emergency contact response to me wherever I am. Does that sound like a good product? <laughs> that got some feedback. Um, interesting question. I, I think cloud computing is a term that is misused. I mean, what does cloud computing really mean? All you're doing is you're, com you're integrating through the internet. And what cl cloud computing to me is that it's a way to get information up and do something with it and get it back down again. But somewhere along the way, you've got to have something to use it on. I mean, so somewhere along the way, you've got to have either an iPad or an iPhone to access or use the information. I'm not sure. I know or believe what the so-called cloud computing is going to do for us yet. Social networking, I'm not even sure about that yet. I know that we're off on this trail. Uh, I'm not sure where the money is in social networking as a business yet. You know, tweeters, gr Twitter is great, but where's, show me what revenue is making. So I believe that Apple's products will, in, will enhance all of those experiences, but I'm not sure if you need a different product for it or not. I think, I think these products already do that, are going to do that, I think. I, think if I don't know if I answered your question or not. Okay. 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 Uh, dear friends, I think that uh, we have invested very well uh, our lunch time, but uh, we can invest uh, more uh, our time uh, reading uh, the very interesting uh, books of uh, Jay Elliott. Uh, specifically, uh, I, I hope that uh, you had the possibility to put a look to the last chapter of the book uh, with the title, uh, more or less, uh, How to Become as Steve Jobs. And uh, this is uh, one way to answer to the question of uh, Jay Elliott when uh, he asked, who are you? And uh, who are you is uh, the right, the more important question of uh, our life. We know very well uh, the answer. You are uh, our uh, students. You are, uh, 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 and uh, we hope, uh, very good uh, citizen, uh, very good manager, as uh, Steve Jobs probably is. And we have to thank uh, also Jay Elliott uh, for uh, his presentation. Thank you very much.